Well, welcome to worship this morning at Faith United Methodist Church. We are glad that you have joined us together today as we discover how God is at work in our lives, how we connect to each other, and then we use our faith to make a difference in the world. My name is Pastor Jeff, and I am glad to be with you this morning in worship. And I invite you into a word of prayer with me now. New every morning is your love, great God of light. And all day long you are working for good in the world. Stir up in us a desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors, and devote each day to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Today is God's Liberation Community. But should we do this again? Yep. The theme of today is God's Liberation Community. Thank you. 
morning from the Faith Peace Garden. Today's scripture lesson is Deuteronomy 34, 1 through 12. Moses dies and is buried in the land of Moab. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Jer Judah as far as the western sea, the, the Negeb and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his servants in the entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, would you please pray with me? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Take my lips and speak with them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Well, we're now into our fifth week of looking at the Ten Commandments, and you know every commandment probably hits us at a different point in our life, maybe creates a little more of a stumbling point uh, for us. We've hit the teenage years when it comes to problematic com commandments, because we're at that one to honor your parents. And I think if we're all honest, when we were a teenager, this was probably the one we were most skeptical of, wondered if maybe it didn't just get kind of slipped in there uh, by some parents uh, rather than by God, um, and certainly one that all of us probably struggled at one point or another with as we were growing up. Now, as we're looking at this commandment today, I also want to asterisk it with that notation that says this is a, a challenge for us, a call for us to do, but it's given in the midst of what I would call maybe not a perfect relationship, but at least a, a loving relationship, a two-way relationship. And then sadly, we know all too often there are issues of abuse and this command is not meant as a cry to those who have been abused that in spite of that they're supposed to honor and respect those parents, but rather is meant to speak to all of us in more better circumstances. And so I don't ever want to see this meant to be used in that way as to challenge people or tell them what to do in those horrific moments. You know, as I was thinking about this commandment, I was thinking back to an experience I had when I was at Beloit College, and Beloit College, like most small liberal arts schools, attracted its fair share of somewhat intelligent to intelligent, certainly people who thought themselves intelligent uh, individuals uh, who would come to school. And what's so remarkable about a place like Beloit is it would just attract all these 18-year-olds that had already figured it all out, right? And so I encountered what I sort of called the first-year philosophy major syndrome, the number of people who would be willing to pontificate for hours and end late at night with each other about the great mysteries of the world and how they had already figured it all out. Before going through their years of school at Beloit, uh, before any of this extra education, they had somehow figured all of the mysteries of the world out. I think actually if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us probably fall into that category at one point of thinking we know it all. I like to think of myself as a, 
as an early bloomer, bloomer to that. I was pretty sure I had it all figured out by age 16 or 17. And so by college, I was more and more aware that I didn't really have a clue as to how it all worked. But this idea, this notion that we have figured it all out is one that I think a lot of us have shared in one way or another. You know, I, I was reminded of this in another form when I was listening to a podcast of an interview with Ken Jennings. If you don't know who Ken Jennings is, he is considered the greatest of all time when it comes to Jeopardy. He, I think he holds, still holds the streak for the longest number of consecutive uh, wins on the show and uh, went on to the Tournament of Greatest of All Times, Tournament of Champions, and won that. So he is the greatest ever for Jeopardy. And there was this interview, this conversation with him. And in addition to being a, an expert at trivia, uh, Ken Jennings also uh, grew up Mormon. I don't recall if he still identifies as Mormon or, or what he would exactly say. But he talked about an experience he's had uh, with experiencing people online, typically in his experience, people of an atheist uh, persuasion who, again, have somehow managed to figure it all out. These are the people that, despite the wisdom of generations, they are so remarkably able to say now, in this time, in this place, they know better than everybody else that's come before them and almost look down on anyone who would sort of cling to these ideas of religion that, you know, sure, maybe no one in the past thought to question, but here now in our enlightened moment, uh, we, can, we can express our doubts. And Ken kind of found this a little bit ridiculous, and I kind of agree with him that there's a danger that we all face in thinking that we somehow uniquely in this time and this place understand things in a way that others before us could never have grasped. And I think instead, what we need to do is remember to look back and recognize the wisdom, the experience, and the knowledge of those that go before us. And I think that's actually what we're trying to get at in this command to honor our parents. Because if you look beyond, we tend to simplify all of our Ten Commandments, and so we tend to think of it as honoring our parents. But that's not the full commandment. The full commandment is honor your parents so that when you come into the promised land, you might be fruitful. You might be successful. You see, this honoring our parents is not just this blanket endorsement of them, this thing we're supposed to do automatically, but is connected to how we are meant to be in this new community, in this new land that we're going into. And I think there's some wisdom to that idea. The reason we honor our parents is not just some sort of age hierarchy of you know, always remember the people who are before you, because I admit, as I get older and older, I kind of wish more and more of my kids would honor me. Uh, sure would make life easier sometimes. Um, but that's not what this is about. This is about how do we live our lives. And, and that's why when I was thinking about this text and what, what other scripture story I could read and share to, to illuminate this, we picked out this story from Deuteronomy, because this is the handing off of the torch, right? This is Moses, at the end of his time leading the people, passing that on to Joshua as he leads the people into the promised land. And now we have a new generation. Moses is the last of those who were in captivity handing it off to the new generation. And so this command to honor our parents is also a command to remember our parents Honor and remember their sacrifices, what they did for us in the positive to get us out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land, but probably also to honor and remember the mistakes they made that caused them to linger for so long in the wilderness. And that we should then in turn learn from our mistakes. You know, I think we make a mistake sometimes when we think about honoring our parents or our ancestors, remembering the past, that we somehow think that means to, to overly glorify it, to pet, put it up on a pedestal and, and idolize it. I don't think that's what we're being called to do. I think we can actually hold intention and ability both to honor and remember those who have come before us and still learn from their mistakes. 
You know, we've been looking a lot over these last few months and years, really, as we rethink our, our early ch- founders of, of this country. And we know that there's a lot on both sides. And it is possible, I think, to honor and remember the courage it took them to stand up to the British and declare independence and the, the power that they brought with these new ideas of democracy and, and things that they brought into this new country. And yet also remember and learn from the mistakes that they had because some of their best lines, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. It's a great start that all men, up oh, there's Jefferson off the rails again, right? Like, we can remember both sides. There's a both and. It was both great that they had these ideas for democracy and terrible that they denied that same power of the people to so many in this country. And the same is true with our parents. To honor remember our parents is not to say our parents have never made mistakes, but instead to honor and remember what they did and build on it. Because actually, I think if we're honest, parenting is really about one thing, right? It's about doing something more for the next generation. And I think that's actually so true that I think it kind of gets built into our idea of what does it be a parent at an early age, because I think all of us at some point, usually around say seven or eight, started to have that thought that said, when I'm a parent, I'm not going to, right? Maybe we resented that we had bedtime or we were mad that we were being rationed on what we could watch on television or we had to eat our vegetables or whatever that thing was we sort of resented. We started to form this idea at that early age. I've learned from my parents' mistakes on how they raised me and I'm going to do better, right? And in fact, usually if we look at our own parenting philosophy, there's probably something in that. We look back and think, I love that my parents did such and such, so I'm doing it too. Or I hated the way my parents forced me to do X, Y, Z, so I'm not doing that for my children. Well, isn't that a way that we honor and remember our parents as we learn from them? We grow from them? We take what we experienced in them and we use it to to do better ourselves? I think there's some real wisdom to that. In fact, it's certainly a better way to approach parenting than just to start from scratch and try to figure it all out on our own. As someone who's doing this parenting thing now, I know for a fact I don't have the time to figure it all out on my own. I'm desperately looking for any sort of wisdom and advice I can get on how to parent and how to do better for my children. Because we all want that. We all want something better, something more for that next generation. Back in 2012, at some point in the presidential campaign, I don't remember the context anymore, but Barack Obama said something that kind of got made into a bigger deal than maybe he thought it was going to be when he said it. Certainly it got made into a bigger deal than I thought it deserved at the time. He made this claim, you didn't build that. And he said it in reference to some debate around sort of the success, I forget if it was specifically Mitt Romney and his success, Uh, as a business person, or rather the generic success of business people. But he was trying, perhaps inelegantly, uh, to make this point that no one in business is self-made. There's no such thing as a a self-made millionaire. That everything is built on something else. And we really, if you think about it, I mean, again, to me when he said it, it was like, well, that's sort of abundantly true. We'd hope we'd all agree to that, but it, it... we came in to do. Um, that's politics for you. But it's so true. I mean, I mean, so much of what we do is built on other people, right? Like I drive from home to work on roads that not only did I not literally build, but I probably didn't pay the taxes for, especially because for the last few years I've been in a parsonage, so I haven't been paying any property tax for years. So I haven't been contributing to the roads, the bridges, and so forth that I, in fact, drive on, and now as an electric car user, I don't pay the gasoline tax anymore. So again, I'm not contributing, but I'm benefiting from the infrastructure that other people have helped to build. Or again, I like to think of myself as an intelligent person. I hold multiple degrees, and it'd be easy to pat myself on the back and say, boy, Jeff, you're so smart. And yeah, I'd like to think I'm smart, but I also know 
the privilege that I come from in that that I came from a family with smart parents, so one, I probably have some good genes, but two, I also have good opportunities. I was raised with the expectation that I would go to college. It was never a question, it was a given. This is just what you did. I lived in a culture that assumed that higher education was something you were going to do, and the question was only what kind of education and how much you were gonna get, or when would you finally stop? And that's a privilege. And I live in a privilege of, of a family that could afford to provide me that education, could put me on that track to success, that provided me the resources growing up and all sorts of other things. So again, all of what we do is built on something before us. And that's what's so important to me about this command to honor our parents. It's specifically about our parents. Yes, let us remember what specifically they have done for us. But I think it's also meant to, to a command to honor the community that comes before us, the generations before us that have put us in this position we are now. Because as the people of Israel are moving out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land, they are meant to be remembering this journey they've been on, the lessons they've learned, and the ways that they are now going to be in a new relationship with God and with each other. And we need to do the same. We need to look to our past to remember all that has been done to get us to this situation. And I mean that both in the good, we live in a prosperous society with so many benefits, but also the bad, we live in a society that has perhaps acquired too many of its benefits at the expense of other people. And how do we learn both from that good and that bad? How do we honor that legacy that we inherit on both sides and resolve to do better in our relationships with each other? Because God wants that for the people of Israel. As God leads them out of slavery in Egypt into the Promised Land, God wants a new relationship with them, this new covenant that's being formed in the Ten Commandments. And that relationship relies upon interdependence. Dependence on God and dependence on each other. Because none of us can do it alone. I mean, again, this text we read in Deuteronomy it spends great lengths talking about how wonderful Moses is, right? This is the guy, unlike any other person, who's seen the face of God and lived. And yet, why is Moses here on this side of the river, not across in the promised land? Because even Moses, who had seen the face of God, struggles. And if with all his knowledge and experiences, he struggles with his faith, what hope do any of the rest of us have without each other and without God? So that's where we always have to start, by honoring and remembering those that have gone before us and those who surround us. Amen. Well, we come now to the time of the prayers of the people. This is a time where we share with each other those prayers that we have, and if you haven't already done so, I invite you to fill out the Google form that we have attached to this worship service. Let us know that you've been in worship with you, us today, because we're so glad you're here, but also share with us any prayers you have, any things that we can be lifting up in prayer right now. And then I would invite you to join with me now in this prayer. O oh, loving God, thank you that you are always with us. We have been on many journeys of life and faith in our lives, journeys of family and career, of friendship and imagination, of personal fulfillment and community building. And we live always with the hope of someday arriving into the light of fulfillment. But we thank you today that as people of faith, our commitment is to the journey itself. We recognize that in many ways our dreams will never be fully actualized, and yet we know that we let go of the possibilities of peace on earth and with true justice and 
Ugh. And we, yet we know that to let go of the possibilities of peace on earth with true justice and equity is to let go of God's heartbeat in our lives. We thank you for the prophets of our world who have held up the visions and shown us the potential, who have led us to the mountaintop from which we can all see the glory of your grace made known on earth. Guide us as we continue to strive to get closer to its fruition on this journey with a hurting planet. Guide our footsteps and help us to be healers. On this journey for racial justice, guide our steps to recognize one another as siblings in your family. On this journey for economic equality, guide our steps toward the common good and enough for all. On this journey with immigrants and sojourners everywhere, guide our steps to notice that even we are sojourners and our welcome is your welcome. On this journey to be your people on earth, guide our steps and teach us to live more fully until we can affirm that journey itself is our home and you are with us all the way. Oh God, we lift these prayers up to you. We lift all those prayers on our hearts, those prayers for needs in our lives, in the lives of our family and friends, in our community, in our world. And so God, we lift all these up to you in the name of Jesus. And so we pray as he taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to end our worship service today and to go out into the world, I do want to give you a few announcements and reminders. First of all, a reminder that uh, we are continuing to record our Tuesday worship services on 
Wednesdays. It actually happens literally after we record these Sunday services. Uh, we record the Wednesday services, and those will be posted uh, by Wednesday evening, so we, if at all possible. So we encourage you to check those out and use those in the middle of the week as a chance to, to recenter yourself um, and find that time of worship um, in the midst of the week. We're also taking part in a collection of Uncore supplies. You may have noticed this announcement in our weekly email uh, newsletter that comes out, but uh, Uncore is collecting supplies, and the Minnesota Conference on Mission Promotion Action Team is arranging a collection site um, to truck donations to the Midwest Mission Distribution Center. And so if you can bring items to the church Tuesday through Thursday um, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., uh, we will uh, help get those into the building so you can leave them outside, ring the doorbell and leave, give the church a call and let them know it's there. We'll make sure they get in to the building uh, so you don't even have to, say, have to come in. Um, we're collecting all the way through October 22nd um, so that we will then um, get those to the donation point uh, that following Saturday uh, at the end of the month there. Also, we have a new prayer group starting. Pastor Nancy started it. On October 1st, it takes place every Thursday evening. Um, we invite you to participate in this event. If it's something that you would like to learn more information about or, or get the Zoom link to, because we are doing it online uh, for safety purposes, uh, please contact Pastor Nancy. I think we have figured out a way uh, for you to connect by phone, too, if that is more comfortable to you. Because really what we want to do, Pastor Nancy is inviting people to do, is join with her in a time of prayer. We are entering into this election season. If you're like me, even I don't watch television that much, and I'm already sick of the ads. Um, we're aware of all the tension that that brings to our lives, the anxiety, the uncertainty, and it is a great time to center ourselves in prayer and reliance on God. And so we invite everyone to be joining with us in prayer, even if you can't come on Thursday night to be in prayer uh, with us. But specifically, uh, Nancy is putting together those experiences on Wednesday or Thursday night um, and invites you to take part in that. It was great to see so many of you outside uh, on last Sunday uh, for our World's Communion Sunday. We are tentatively planning to have our next outdoor service on November 8th. I say tentatively because on the one hand, we are full steam ahead to have the service on the 8th, and we also know it's Minnesota in the fall, and it could be beautiful out uh, like it has been this week, or it could be not beautiful out like it kind of was the week before. Um, and we don't know what the weather's going to bring, but we do know that if at all possible, we'd love to have another outdoor worship service on November 8th. So put that on your calendar, make plans to come, and if the weather turns against us and the snow flies and it's not going to happen, we will let you know closer to that date. But please plan on that. We look forward to that opportunity. Now, as I was uh, preparing for the sermon, reflecting on it, and, and really actually just praying through the service here, I was reminded that this text uh, that we read today was really a key part of the last message that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King gave the day before he was assassinated. And he talked about how he had been to the mountaintop and he had seen the promised land, but he wasn't going to go over. He knew that the work of racial justice that he had dedicated his whole life to was going to need to continue long after he was gone. We are continuing, seeking to continue that work of Dr. King in our lives today. We are seeking to continue the work, as John Wesley put it, of moving on to perfection as we seek to be better followers of God, better Christians each and every day. So let us go forth with God's grace and seek to be God's love in the world as we live into that legacy of those who have gone before us. Amen.